All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Mr. Ray. <laughs> How you guys doing? Good. Did you have a good Christmas, New Year, all that jazz? Anyone get up to anything really exciting? Canberra. Canberra, whoa, easy tiger. <laughs> all right, fantastic. Uh, that's clearly the benchmark. We'll go from there. Uh, look, it's great to be back. Uh, I had a bit of a break myself, and uh, yeah, I'm really, I'm really excited for this year. There's a real vibe in the office. Who would agree? Like, there's a real vibe uh, about this year, and I think we've got a massive year ahead of us. Uh, today, as we um, said in Hamilton Island, what I want to do today is really just consolidate, but also introduce you guys to some new concepts that we do with our clients that you guys have never done before. So today is really about us getting incredibly crystal about what has to happen in the first three months of this year in every single department at a department level and also at an interpersonal level as well. Today I want you to have the beginner mindset because this is all about mastery and mastery is the pursuit of knowledge. Okay, mastery is the pursuit of multiple perspectives and point of views so that you can become you know, incredibly conscious of multiple scenarios in any one situation. Okay, you don't become the best fighter in the world by fighting one dimensionally. You don't become the best tennis player in the world by playing one dimensionally. You become the best at any sport or any discipline in the world when you become four dimensional. Okay, and four dimensional is multiple perspectives. Okay, you're not looking at it from one dimension, you're looking at it from multiple dimensions to see things that others can't. That's what real mastery is about. Real mastery is being able to see things that other people can't in the everyday things that we see every day. How do we see the things that other people can't? You start looking at it from a different point of view. Can we get everyone to just turn their phones on to silent? I probably should have said it from the start. Uh, or even just turn them off. You don't need your phones today, okay? Unless you've got a family member that's ill or um, that kind of stuff. But yeah, if you could all turn your phones on to silent, that'd be great. So today, I really want to kick off you know, with the performance conversation. And what we're talking about right now really is indicating where we start with all of our clients and all of the, all, when it comes to performance. So what is the first thing we start with with all of our clients when it comes to performance? What is the first concept that people need to grasp if they want to put, can we turn this fucking thing off like it's shining in my eyes? Um, no? That's okay. <laughs> what is the first concept that we talk about with our clients at the beginning of any education, any information, whether we're talking about business or whether we're talking about performance? Psychology. Before we even talk about psychology. Okay. Like, Okay, bingo. The first thing we talk about is a concept called consciousness. Now, I'm not talking about this in a, necessarily in a spiritual context, context, although it has major spiritual application okay, and implications. And by spiritual, I'm not talking religious. Okay? I'm not talking dogma. I'm not talking doctrine. Okay? I'm talking higher self. I'm talking higher power. And the way that we become more aware of our higher self and higher powers is by opening our minds up to things that we've never seen before. You've got to become aware that the brain processes 16 trillion bits of information every one second. That's an enormous amount of information. But the brain is only capable, in most cases, of processing 2,000 bits consciously at any one second. So what that means is, like I'm talking 99.99999% of your reality is unconscious. There is only a very tiny, small fragment of your reality that, is, that you're actually aware of. And whether you're, you know, you're trying to pursue, uh, pursue enlightenment or whether you're trying to pursue mastery, the goal is how do I increase my level of awareness? How do I become more conscious okay, of the things that allow me to work in a four-dimensional way versus one-dimensional? One-dimensional players don't win championships. Okay? One-dimensional players don't become the number one in the world. Okay? It's the, one that, the people that can play on multiple dimensions, dimensions are the ones that can pull things off that no one else can. There's a little concept in psychology that I want to talk to you guys about that really relates to how powerful and how important this is. <clears throat> has anyone ever been in the situation before? Maddie, just make sure you're not blocking the view of the people behind you, bud. Um, has anyone ever been in a situation before where you've been looking for something and you can't find it, but it was right in front of you. I'm talking keys, sunglasses, or you go to the cupboard, you open the cupboard, and you're looking for the fucking salt, and you can't find it. Has anyone ever had that happen before? But has anyone ever had that situation happen before where you go to the cupboard, let's say you're looking for salt, your sunglasses, a pair of keys, or, or whatever. You open the cupboard, you have a quick look around, you have a quick glance, you don't see the salt. So what's the first thing you say in your mind when you can't find the salt? The salt's not there. Now, what is that from a psychological perspective? What is that? When you say to yourself, the salt isn't there, what is that statement? 
it's what's called a suggestion. And our brains respond to suggestions. Okay, the way you hypnotize someone, the way you induce specific behaviors, the way that you condition children, okay, or even animals, is by constantly applying suggestions over and over and over again. If you tell a child, okay, 3,000 times between the ages of three and six, that, oh, you're fucking so stupid, why do you do that? By the time that child is 15, what do you think there's going to be a fundamental belief in that child? That I'm stupid. Who's been to Nissi before? Okay, and you guys know where I'm going with this, right? You guys will wake up at 4.30 a.m. No. <laughs> yeah. Everyone's like, fuck no! Like, what's really interesting is when you go to Nissi, when you see the K2s at the front of the room and I start doing that, they all go like this. <laughs> because all I do is I suggest between 34 to 38 times that everyone in the room is going to wake up at 4.30 a.m. And as a result of 34 fucking suggestions, guess what happens? Somewhere between 50 and 70% of the room wake up at an ungodly time and they're like, what the fuck happened? <laughs> Here's what's really interesting. At least 20 to 30% continue years after Nissi to wake up at 4.30 a.m. And how do I know this? Because they fucking send me a message. You motherfucker, I keep waking up at 4.30 a.m. <laughs> so the concept of consciousness, okay, is leveraged by our psychology. Because when you go to the cupboard and you open the doors, you go, I can't find the salt. That is a very powerful suggestion. And as a result, your brain whoosh, wipes the salt away, even when it's right in front of you. In psychology, or in psych psychiatric terms, it's called a scotoma. And a scotoma is a psychologically induced blind spot. Okay? And blind spots are what kill when people drive on the road because they can't see what they can't see and you don't know what you don't know and if you can't see what you can't see okay and there's a truck coming to you out of your blind spot and you can't see it and you pull out in the road what's going to happen it's going to end in tragedy okay now that might be an extreme example but it makes my point the way that we you know not only extend our life as human beings but the way that we extend our potential is by becoming more conscious to me consciousness is the answer for everything you open the cupboard you say oh i can't see the salt and then you yell out to your partner honey have you seen the salt? And what does she say or he say? It's in the cupboard. And you go, no, it's not. I'm looking in the cupboard. And what do they say? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And you say, no, it's not. Yes, it is. No, it's not. And so they fucking come running down the stairs and through the kitchen. I'm, what the fuck is this, bozo? And you're like, I swear to God that was not there a, a second ago. Who's ever experienced this before? And then you literally go, fuck. Like what? And has anyone ever had the situation before? Like, I can't find my keys. Can't find my keys. Uh, and then in five minutes later, you find the keys in your hand. Or you're looking around, can't find my sunglasses, can't find, oh, fuck, they're on my head. Okay? The challenge is for most of us, these are the things that happen naturally. I can't find my sunglasses, I can't find my sunglasses, I can't find my sunglasses. My job is hard. This is difficult. We can't solve this problem. It's really important that you guys start becoming acutely aware and conscious of every single fucking thing that goes on in your head. Because the way that you attain mastery starts with the mind. And when it comes to the mind, the mind, you need to understand, is nothing more than an operating system that responds to commands. If I can make thousands of people over years continually wake up at 4.30 a.m. by suggesting somewhere between, let's call it 40 times that they're going to wake up, imagine how your brain is responding if you beat yourself and go, ah, oh, fuck, I'm so stupid. But imagine if you've been saying that for like five years every time you make a mistake, 10 years. Imagine if you've been saying that your whole life. Is it any wonder sometimes people find it hard to break through when they're constantly reinforcing suggestions that in most cases aren't even this? Because if you were to look at, oh, I'm just so fucking stupid, in most cases, that didn't come from you. In most cases, that came from an external voice in your world, you know, a parent, a teacher, a friend, Someone who, in most cases, was so unconscious that they didn't realize the damage that they were doing. I never read a book cover to cover until the age of 23. Now, I don't blame my father for, for what he did, but my father was quite unconscious. And as a result, he used to repetitiously tell me on a very regular basis, Ah, oh, you're so fucking stupid. You're so fucking stupid. Now, what's interesting is I often look at myself as someone who's not academic. But now, since the age of 23, I look at the amount of knowledge that I've acquired and gone, I may not have been academic, but fuck, I'm actually quite smart. Does this make sense? But it took me 23 years to discover that. 
because for the first portion of my life, someone was continually suggesting that I was stupid, and as a, and as a direct result of that, what's interesting when you look at my, my scholastic years is, I failed every single subject from year one all the way through to year 12, every subject. I never passed one subject. I don't know if you guys can comprehend the level of reinforcement that a small child, an adolescent would get, that every time they go to a test, they failed. How, how much could you reinforce stupidity? How much could you reinforce you know, a, a lack of intelligence than that kind of an example? That's not true. I did fail, uh, sorry, I did actually pass one semester uh, of what was called veggie maths. <laughs> But I'm pretty sure, the, it was called veggie mass, they called it social mass or whatever it was. But I'm pretty sure the only reason my teacher passed me is because I had a temporary teacher for three months. Uh, and we smoked a joint together outside of school. And I was pr pretty sure he was just a little scared that I was going to dob him in. So he's like, fuck, poor kid, he's never passed anything. We'll give him a fucking good grade, right? Now, the reason I share my story with you is I want you guys to know who I am. Because some of you may not have heard that story. Some of you have heard this story fucking 20 times, 1,000 times. Okay, but my point being is, we all have the capability to change. Just because I was told that I was stupid repetitiously, consistently for an extended period of time, years of my life, which was then referenced with evidence that I was based on every single academic interaction, didn't mean that it was a life sentence. And so by becoming more conscious of the stories that we run, we actually give ourselves the opportunity for liberation. And by liberation, I mean freedom. And the greatest freedom that you can get is actually the freedom from negative thoughts, the freedom from destructive thoughts, the freedom from the thoughts that hold you, okay, and cage you from relinquishing and unleashing your full potential. But you're never going to be able to achieve your full... You're never going to be able to be unleashed if you don't know where your cage is. And most people are living in a cage that is unconscious. And the cage that is unconscious is the stories that they run in their head. <clears throat> so this concept of consciousness, as I said... It can be applied to spirituality. It can be applied to religion. But I'm saying, let's just apply this to general life. Let's become a lot more conscious. Are they going to turn this thing off? Because it's... it's well, I turned off the spotlight. There's a, I don't know if you can see. There's a big I fucking light. It is, but if you turn that off, then I can get this back on. Okay, don't worry about it. It's just that corner. Can we just shift that? So just shift to the little... Yep. <laughs> that's, that's it. There we go. Just done that. <laughs> it's all good. Just shut up from me. Bernie, what are you doing? Oh. <laughs> and over to Boone. <laughs> Thanks, Booney. Ladies and gentlemen, Booney! My saviour. So, to me, I'm always about what's, how do we most effectively... <laughs> Fuck, this right now. <clears throat> That's my standing spot. Okay. So, my question always is, wow, it feels weird. Like, I always dominate the right-hand side of the stage, don't I? Because I, this feels weird standing over here. Maybe it's all this masculine energy. I'm not sure. <laughs> to me, look, um, when I was growing up, one of the other suggestions that was given to me on a very regular basis, this one was by my mum, uh, is you're so fucking lazy. You're so lazy. You're so lazy. You're so lazy. Now... As a result, there was a lot of evidence to suggest that she was actually right because it was something that I, you know, I oftentimes didn't want to do a lot of... Like, I was very active as a child, hyperactive, in fact. But when it came to doing chores, I fucking hated doing chores. Can anyone relate? Like, who likes fucking washing the dishes, right? Who likes packing the dishwasher as a child, okay? Who likes mowing the lawn when you're seven years old, right? It's fucking dangerous. So, no, Mum, I don't want to mow the lawn. I'm seven. You're going to fucking mow the lawn. But what's interesting is the labels that we use to define us can actually be the very same things that we can use to break through. You know, I'm also an addict. But what I realize as a result of my, my path through addiction to substance, okay, is it's made me incredibly resourceful. Because I still remember, like, like uh, my, 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 my very first experience with addiction was I, was I was addicted to amphetamines, to speed, right? And for a nine-month period, I was using speed almost every single day. I was working in the security industry, so I was working nights. Okay, and so it, was very, it, it basically just fell in really easy. And the first time I tried speed was like literally one of the first times in my life I actually felt normal. Because it was the first time my brain chemistry was actually able to stabilize. It was the first time my brain had sufficient levels of dopamine to actually feel like what it was like to be normal. So I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. So this is how you feel normal. But what was really interesting is that I had two other mates at the same time. We all got hooked together. But I still remember many times throughout that nine months, I'd go over to my mate's place and I'd go, right, who's got some gear? And the boys would be like, oh, fuck, no, we're out. Everyone's dry. I'd say, everyone's dry? Did you ring everyone? 
everyone. They go, yeah, yeah, we tried everyone. And then I'd spend fucking two hours, three hours in front, fucking ringing people, driving to people's houses. Sure enough, two, three hours later, I'd be driving back with a bag of gear. Now, you're probably some of you are like, fuck, where's this going? <laughs> where this is going is, I never quit. Does this make sense? And so when I got into business, I had to not look at myself as someone who was a recovering drug addict, who, had no, who was stupid, who was lazy, who had no potential. I had to look at myself and go, where am I really good? Well, I was really good at always getting drugs, okay? <laughs> as an example. Why? Because when you want something bad enough, you'll do anything you possibly can within your moral compass to get the outcome complete. Does this make sense? And as soon as I acknowledge that part of myself, I no longer was embarrassed about being an addict. I actually became actually quite proud because I was like, wow. Because when I actually got into business and at the same time I had two or three other mates around the same time all getting into business, they're all now back in, in, in employee land, which is nothing wrong with that. But what I discovered is they didn't have, and it's not the same guys, they didn't have what it took. They didn't have the resilience to make sure that they got what they wanted. Does this make sense? So if you want something bad enough, you can get it. What's going to come down to how you get it will be determined by your moral compass and the values with which you behave. So to me, consciousness is important. We need to become conscious of the labels that we've applied to ourselves. Okay, I'm lazy. Okay, how do I use that to my advantage? I'm not lazy, I'm efficient. I look for the fastest, easiest, most efficient and intelligent way to get somewhere versus going, well, everyone's doing it this way. I should do, do what everyone else is doing. I'm like, no, just because everyone does it that way doesn't mean that's what I should do. How can I do it smarter? How can I do it more intelligently? But more importantly, how can I do it in less time, more efficiently and get an even better outcome? Not how do I cut corners and get there quickly and maybe get an okay kind of outcome. How do I become more efficient, more effective and deliver a higher quality result? So for me, it's where we focus consciousness that allows us to really thrive. Because you can focus consciousness into your relationship and guess what will happen? If you start becoming more conscious of the stories you are saying to yourself about your relationship and the things you're saying to yourself when you're in your relationship, because some people are literally in a relationship and they're looking at their partner going, oh, you fucking bitch, I just fucking can't believe it. Yes, honey. Oh, yes, honey. I love you, you fucking cow. <laughs> You know what I'm talking about, right? Some of you are like, going, hee hee hee. <laughs> You're laughing because it's fucking true. But here's what's interesting. I've noticed in every relationship that I've ever had, especially the last time, and especially my, my, my marriage, is when I had a dis, disharmonious story going in my head, and when I applied my consciousness to that story, even if I was being polite, the relationship just deteriorated. Even if I wasn't saying what was on my mind because it was the energy that was being projected. Does this make sense? So for me, I had to start applying consciousness. Okay, I might be mad right now. I might just want to you know, tear this woman apart and tell her everything I don't like about her. But that's not going to help. And so I started to train myself to, in situations where I felt mad to just sit there and go, all right, what is it that I love about you? And I literally in my head start focusing and shining my consciousness towards what are the things that I love about you? And as a result, our relationship became stronger. It didn't last, it still didn't last, but it definitely made a massive impact on the way that we communicate and the way that we transition through that process. I can tell you right now, for most people, I don't know some people may have not have been through that, going through a marriage breakdown is not an easy thing to, to go through, especially when you have a very strong ideal around, you know, gonna get married once, I'm gonna have, you know, <clears throat> family forever. And when that breaks down, that's a lot to deal with. And we've got to learn in situations like that, whether it be a marriage breakdown, whether it be a, uh, a friendship breakdown, or whether it be a health breakdown, or whether it be a, you know, a job breakdown, how do we navigate more effectively and efficiently to get the best possible outcome that we can? By shining our consciousness in the right area. So in this context, when it comes to performance, where we apply our consciousness to for greatest effect is, our, is the area of psychology. Okay, and psychology, mindset. <clears throat> Everyone take a sip of water, please. Let's stay nice and hydrated. Our psychology is what runs the game. So when you think about, because has anyone here ever done things where like, fuck, why do I do that? Like, has anyone here got a behavior that they, <laughs> Tracy's like, I've got both hands up. <laughs> yeah. Righty, eh? <laughs> But has anyone ever, has anyone here got certain behaviours that when they do them, they sit back and go, fuck, why do I do that? 
Like, why do I do that? You know, whether it be you know, when it comes to looking after your personal health or whether, whether it comes to you know, picking a certain type of partner, whether it comes to eating certain food. There are certain behaviors that we all have that are so unconscious that when they happen, we sit, literally sit and go, fuck, why do I do that? Because I know every time I do it, it creates a bad response. Why do I keep doing this? Why do I smoke a cigarette? Because every time I smoke it, I feel like shit. But then an hour later, I'm craving one again. And then I have it, but I feel like, why do I keep doing this? Now, when you look at any form of behavior, okay, it all comes back to the way that our brain has been wired. Your brain is the most magnificent bioorganic piece of mush in the universe. Why? Because every single one of you can program it, you can wire it, and we have this thing, our brains are, you know, have this thing called neuroplasticity, which means the thing is never hardwired. So you could be told you're stupid every day of your life until the age of 23, but if you change your way your psychology works, you can change everything within a matter of days, weeks, months, and in some cases years, depending on the level of application. So when we talk about psychology, and you know, because who here has heard the word psychology used before? Who here has you heard the word um, mindset used before? Okay, or um, personal development. Like for me, when we look at the psychology, one of the most important things is how do we create a common language that we can all understand? How can we create a common framework that we can all agree upon as a good understanding? Because when you hear the word psychology, what does psychology mean to you? I'm actually curious. Like what, when you hear the word psychology, what does it mean to you? The way we think. The study of behavior. Mindset. Here, and if I got everyone to write it down, we'd probably end up with about 34 different examples of what a psychology is. Not that there's anything wrong with that, okay? But in order for us to move forward collectively, we need a common language. We need a common framework that we can all look at, refer to, and use, not just on ourselves, but also to support each other. Because most of what I'm gonna be sharing with you today, yes, you're gonna be applying it directly to your own life, not just in the business, not just in the world of work, but also in your personal life. Because what we're going through right now, what's most fascinating is with the K2s, with the clients we do this work with on a consistent basis, what area of their life do you think we affect the most? Personal. Personal. Number one, relationships. What do you think is the second area of their life that we affect the most? Their health. And what do you think is the third area of their life that we affect the most? Their business, in that order. Okay, performance isn't an external game. It's not about having the right Facebook ad strategy, okay? It's not having, about having the right content strategy. You will never outgrow, the, a business owner will never be able to grow their business beyond their own development, okay? You will never be able to express your potential in your role beyond your own development. And the way that you step into mastery, the way that you step into higher levels of potential is by going within, okay? But every now and then, it's hard to go within because sometimes we don't see what we can't see because we've got a suggestion running or we've got a story running that prevents us from being able to see the thing that's blocking us. But oftentimes all it takes is someone on the outside to look at us and go, hey, something I've noticed is this. I don't mean to be rude, but it's just something I've noticed. I'm not sure if this would be helpful, but this is something I see. Now, has anyone had a conversation with anyone in this organization that goes a little like that, and you're like, oh, fuck, thank you so much, that's been really helpful. Put your hand up if you had a conversation like that. Okay, and if you haven't got your hand up, I guarantee you, you will by the end of the first quarter, if not the first year, at least the first six months. Because that's the type of organization we are. You know, we've been doing a few interviews lately, and, and people say to me, often, and I heard this three times yesterday, what does it take to, um, to perform in this organization? I said, well, you know what? This organization is a little bit like Cinderella's shoe. And there's three types of Cinderella. And some of you might be familiar with this. If I interviewed you at some point, you would have heard this. Cinderella number one comes in and they hear in the interview process that every single member in this team that has passed their probation period is a high performer. Okay, every single one. And they go, and in, internally they're like, oh my God, that's exciting. But then they get in here and they look around and in the first week, guess what they start thinking? Holy fuck, it's true. Oh my God, these people are fucking freaks. But then... For Cinderella number one, that environment doesn't become attractive, it becomes what? Scary. Scary. Threatening. Because they look at that scenario and go, shit, everyone here is a high performer. Psychology. I'm not. I feel less than, less worthy, and the source of my pain is what? The organization. 
And these are the people that within their first, you know, month, two months, they're always complaining for no reason. They've always got little things to say that kind of just sit there and go, that's an interesting statement. Or they bring an energy that's like, "Mm, I can see they're not quite invested. And at some point, they deselect. Now, in our organization, if you're not aware, one of the things that we are very pro on is deselection because I don't, I'm not a fan of firing anyone. I fucking hate firing people. Now, I don't think it's the ni- a nice thing to do, but sometimes it's required. I think sometimes the healthiest thing that you can do for someone is sit down with them and help them come to their own conclusion that it's not working out. Does this make sense? And then you empower them to make the decision themselves. And with Cinderella number one, that's no- 99% of the time, that's the path that goes down. Deselection or self-selection. Then you've got Cinderella number two. Cinderella number two comes in and goes, holy fuck, he wasn't fucking around. These people are high performers. These people are incredible. I'm not a high performer though, but I want to be. And they start going, role model, role model, role model, mentor, mentor, role model, role model, mentor, role model. And they start looking at the environment and they start becoming inspired by it because they may not see themselves in that moment as a high performer. They go, but fuck, I want to be. And God damn it, I'll do whatever I can. I will sit and listen and tap into and, you know, sponge everything I possibly can. Okay, and then you've got Cinderella number three. And Cinderella number three comes in and goes, okay, these people are a little bit weird. They're just like me. Oh my God, I'm home. I've just found my forever home. And they say things like, this is the place that I've been looking for. Because you realise, I cannot tell you how many times that I've heard this from people, team members, they come in and they go, yeah, I, I just don't understand it. The last job that I had, when I used to try really hard, people would just pull me down, even the boss. Because anyone got any experience with that? Where when you tried to exceed, people would pull you down. Like, dude, I'm fucking trying to do this for you and you're pulling me back? Like, what the fuck? In this environment, we don't pull you back. We push you forward. We hold you up. But sometimes what's required regardless of where you are on the Cinderella journey, is an external force to come in and apply a level of consciousness to your psychology in that situation that you perhaps can't see. Because sometimes we're so in our shit that we can't see above it. And when you're in the forest, what do you see? Trees. Okay, but when you're in a helicopter, okay, 300 feet above the forest, what do you see? You see a forest. And sometimes when it comes to our problems, Okay, we need to drill into them. Okay? Fly above them. <laughs> Fuck off, Timmy. <laughs> Fly above them. No, but this is true. The challenge that most of us have when it comes to an obstacle is we can't get above them. We've really got to do something. Okay. We can't get above them. And we, when we can't get above our problems, when we're in our problems, what is typically firing? Emotions. Can I use are these whiteboard markers? It's been more than 15 minutes. Oh, hang on, I might just use... It triggers our emotions. And what's an emotion? We know what a consciousness is, okay? We're going to explore what a psychology is. We understand what a scotoma is. A scotoma is a psychologically induced suggestion. Okay, that, we, that manifests as a result of repetition. But what is an emotion? Response to thoughts. Sorry? Response to thoughts. Response to thoughts? Feeling. To feeling? Chemical reaction. You've fucking been a nissy too many times. <laughs> but that's exactly what it is. An emotion, because people say it's energy in motion. Yeah, sure. But what it is, is it is a chemical response. You've got this little part of your brain called the hypothalamus. Okay, it's literally like the the centrifuge. It's the pharmaceutical plant of your brain. And whenever you see something, interpret any stimulus or information, what happens is, all right, everyone is... Wowzers. Awesome. Thanks, guys. You can leave it right there. That's awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, our amazing AV crew! Thank you, brother. It goes through, you experience a stimulus, right? It could be uh, audio, visual, or, or kinesthetic, it could be, or a combination of, okay? That stimulus travels through a network of synapses and neurons. 
that have previously been used to identify what things mean. Then it hits the hypothalamus, tickles the hypothalamus, and then the hypothalamus releases a combination of what's called neuropeptides. They travel down through the pituitary gland, into the bloodstream, and they go and connect with every single cell in your body. And they literally change the way the cell behaves. Those neural peptides are like sustenance, they're like a food, but they are also an indication to trigger certain behaviors at a cellular level. So when you experience an emotion, what you're actually experiencing is a cellular response. And your cells, when they interact with a peptide, so you've got a cell, okay, and every single cell has certain receptors, and let's say your happiness receptors look like squares and your Sadness receptors look like triangles, and so the neuropeptides for sadness will be triangles, okay? And what they'll do is they'll come bumping down here, and go, no, it doesn't fit, doesn't fit, doesn't fit, doesn't fit. Oh, here we go, this fits. They lock into the cell, and the cell literally starts to change behave. And the cell either starts to oscillate and vibrate at a high rate of frequency, or it starts to oscillate and, and vibrate at a lower rate of frequency. Now, I don't know about you, but what have you noticed about people who are really excited? What do they do? When people are really excited, what do they do? What do they do? What do they do? Tell me what they do. What do they do when people are really excited? They talk really fast. They talk really fast and move really what? Quickly. Who's noticed that? Yeah, right? Like, fucking look at a 10-year-old who you've just told you take them to Wonderworld, right? Or fucking Disneyland. They're like, oh, there we go. They're running around. Ah! <laughs> it's a fucking Home Alone moment, right? I watched Home Alone again over Christmas. Fuck, that's a good movie. It's a physical manifestation Okay, a verbal manifestation, an intellectual manifestation of what's happening at a cellular level. Now, how do people respond when they're sad? Slow. They typically move slower. They talk slower. Often breathe a lot more shallow, especially if they're depressed and voice. deeper voice, lower octave. They just, yeah, I don't know. It's just not for me. Don't know what's going on. I just, yeah, I just don't feel great. And that's a physical manifestation of what's happening at a cellular level. So the next time you're at a party and someone says, how you doing, Jake? Say, I'm consciously aware that my vibratory state is high. <laughs> and I'll be like, Jake's got the drugs! <laughs> <laughs> Captain MDMA over here! But my point being is, there are not just psychological implications of emotion, okay? There are biological, biophysical, and quantum mechanical implications of emotions because when we look at the types the emotional spectrum there's an emotional spectrum right you've got high positive emotions and you've got low negative emotions okay and that is the spectrum that emotions work on and somewhere in the middle you've got what's called neutral which means absent of emotion and so when you're walking through life and something happens and it excites you, okay, and you're quite unconscious to your emotional response in certain situations, and you're unconscious of how to regulate your emotions because you just respond to whatever stimulus is there because that's what everybody does in most cases. Something positive happens in your life, chances are you're gonna get a little bit what? You're gonna get a little bit excited, okay? And all of a sudden, your pendulum is gonna swing over towards the excited part of the spectrum of emotions. You're like, yeah, oh my God. Now, has anyone ever had this situation, external of this company, where you've been like, oh my God, this is amazing. Something happens and you start celebrating, get really excited, and then someone comes in and pisses on your parade. <laughs> has anyone ever had that happen before? Who sees it happening with remarkable timing and accuracy around certain contexts and groups of individuals and social settings? Who's seen that? Like, all of a sudden, you're excited, and then someone comes in to try and piss on your parade. What I've noticed is, sometimes it's a person, sometimes it's an event, sometimes it's a perspective. Because has anyone here ever been really excited before? Oh my God, yeah, this is amazing. And then you get an email that you owe fucking five grand to the tax department. You're like, oh. Okay, all of a sudden, you're like, yes, this is amazing. Oh, this is great. Oh, fuck, what if it goes wrong? What if it fails? Has anyone ever experienced that before, right? So these are natural consequences of things that happen at a biophysical level. And what typically happens from there is we go, fuck, they're both blue. From feeling a high positive emotion, 
We then go down screaming here to a low negative emotion on the spectrum. And all of a sudden we're like, oh no, oh my God, what if it all goes wrong? I can't believe you said that. Whatever the event means or the person said or your internal interpretation, you start going, oh no. And then in some cases, the very person who pissed on your parade is the one that's coming up going, look, I'm really sorry. I didn't mean what I just said. It's all right. You're doing really well. And they pick you up and they start throwing you back into the other end of the spectrum. Has anyone ever had that happen before? Where the very person who just pissed you off then comes in and goes, I'm sorry. Or you're sitting there going, oh my God, what if it all goes wrong? And then you start thinking to yourself, yeah, but what if it all goes right? And then you start bringing yourself back up to the high positive environment. Or an event happens where you get the email for, you owe $5,000. Oh my God, life is over. You owe, you open your email, fucking, you owe $5,000 tax. Oh my God, that's fucking terrible. And next thing you know, you get another email going, you've just made a $7,000 sale. Who's ever experienced something like that before? Okay. When your cells start to behave, they have biophysical consequences. When you vibrate at a high, okay. Let's say I grab, um, an electron, right? I take an electron, I rip it away from its orbit, put it in a vacuum chamber. What is the charge of an electron? You guys are clearly all physicists. <laughs> it's negative charge, okay? But this is what I'm about to go now. It's pretty much physics 101. But let's say I take that little negatively charged subatomic particle and I then throw it into the ether. What is that little particle going to do naturally? It's going to go and look for what? It's going to go and look for a positive charge. Why? To neutralize, but why? But why? <laughs> but why? <laughs> because the punchline is the universe is constantly seeking balance. The universe naturally constantly seeks balance. So when you're in this high positive state, the universe is going, your charge, your physical cellular charge is charged up. You are emanating a high charge, a positive charge. And as a result, what do you become? A shit magnet. I'm not kidding. I've been on this planet long enough, observed my own behaviors and situation context, and others, you know, through not just our own work, but also the work that we do with our clients, that this is typically what happens. You get a high positive charge, you're going to attract someone to come in and neutralize you. Okay, you're going to attract a thought that is going to come in and neutralize you. You're going to attract an event that will come in and neutralize you. But we have this little thing called an ego. An ego doesn't like to be neutralized. So what do you think the, where do you think the universe is trying to take you? It's trying to take you here. But we don't interpret the information coming in as the universe trying to balance us out. We take it personally. And we either become self-righteous, yeah, I'm fucking amazing, or self-righteous, oh no, I'm not. And as a result, we constantly end up swinging back and forth, happy, sad, happy, sad. Some people are like a fucking propeller. They're like, <laughs> who knows what I'm talking about, right? Where the power is, is in the middle. Because... Emotions just don't have a biophysical implication, meaning it affects what you attract and repel, you know, law of attraction, pseudo. But it also has psychological implications because when you experience an emotion, we are working on that drilling, aren't we? Yeah. When you experience an emotion, you can't stay in a high positive state unless you are completely, back. sorry, that is just doing my head in. <laughs> you can't stay in a high positive state unless you're doing what? Unless you're filtering out 50% of your reality. You can't be happy if you're thinking about sad things. You can't be. It's not how it works. Because if you're happy and you start thinking about sad things, what are you going to become? Sad, okay? And you can't be sad and think about happy things without being what? Happy. Pretty fucking straightforward, right? But the implications at a conscious level are pro-fucking-found. Because when you are in that heightened state of high emotion at a positive range, 
you have to filter out every single potential negative downside in order to stay there. Has anyone here ever been taken advantage before because someone pro like got you super excited about big promises, you didn't consider any downside whatsoever, and as a result, when you got in there, you saw the negative downside and you're like, fuck, I never anticipated that. Oh no, this is the worst thing ever. And it went from being the best opportunity in the world to being the worst things ever happened. Who's ever experienced that before? Okay, we all have. But it's a catch-22. Honestly, I'm not playing five grand for this. It's a catch-22. When you are sad, you can't not okay, stay sad unless you are filtering out all positive potential. Now, has anyone here ever been in a situation before whereby something, someone offered you an opportunity all you saw was downside, you're like, oh no, and you became a little bit skeptical, and as a result, you decided, no, nah, I'm not going to take advantage of that, a little bit skeptical. And then three months later, you realized, fuck, that was actually a really good opportunity. Has anyone ever had that before? See, the psychological implications, first of all, the physical, biophysical implications are, we are living, breathing human electromagnets. We carry charge. That charge is determined by our emotional state and how our psychology is running. And that determines the things that we draw in, the people that we draw in, the events and the perspectives that we draw in, and also the people, perspectives and events that we repel at the same time, which has huge implications. But at a psychological level, the implications are profound because what we are projecting our consciousness towards determines what we see and what we scotoma. Now, I don't know about you, but one of the things that I've learned about in life is in order to make a good decision, what do you need? Every story has what? Well, there's three sides to every story. There's your side, their side, and the truth. And there's three perspectives. There's the heightened emotional perspective, there's the lower emotional perspective, and there's a neutral perspective. And what do you think is the, is the truth? Neutral. The truth is neutral. The neutral is absent of emotion, whereby you are not um, biased by an emotional lens. We all, we, all exp we all are biased, whether you realize it, or not, realize it or not. We all have a level of bias at a psychological level based on our conditioning, our experience, you know, the events, trauma, parenting, schooling, multiple things. But what determines our ability to perform at a very high level is our ability to see things that others can't. And the way that we see things that others can't is by learning how to regulate emotions when we become conscious that we're in one. Because there's also, bio, bio, not just biochemical, but biophysical, biochemical, biophysical, and neurological implications. What is an emotion in the body? As a substance. What is it? It's a chemical, yes. It's a chemical reaction, yes. But as a substance, what is it? It is highly addictive. Emotions, this is the part I want you to really listen to, work on the same receptors, because this isn't just a sadness receptor, guess what? It's also a receptor for barbiturates. This isn't just a happiness receptor, it's also a receptor for amphetamine. The receptors in the brain that are responsible for connecting with emotions are the exact same receptors in the brain responsible for the effects of alcohol, drugs, and barbiturates and other forms of narcotics. And so what happens is, when you, what do cells constantly do? Split and divide, okay? And as a result, whatever changes happen in that cell, okay, are then replicated when they divide in the division. You, you understand what I'm talking about here? Okay, that's how we, our bodies are constantly reproducing, constantly, you know, regenerating, because they're splitting, dividing, splitting, dividing, splitting, dividing, splitting, dividing. And as each cell evolves to its environment, the next round of the division are the evolved species of the environment of the previous cell. Who understands what I just said, right? Okay, but if you take a cell and you keep bombarding it with sadness over and over and over and over again, how will that cell evolve? Now, in the next evolution of the division, there's not going to be two receptors for sadness. There's now going to be three receptors for sadness and one receptor for happiness. Now, what did I say peptides are to a cell? They're sustenance. They provide a level of sustenance to this at a cellular level. 
And so when those cells get hungry, what do you think they're going to crave? Sadness. What is your brain made of? Cells. What's your bones, tissue, skin, hair, cartilage all made of? Cells. Blood. Cells. Your cells have the ability, if you're unconscious, to direct your entire behavior. Not just your psychology, your cells do. Your cells have the ability, if you're unconscious, to direct your behavior in order for them to get their fix. Because when you're experiencing an emotion, and I want you to draw some contrast here, it is the equivalent of being high or drunk. Let's battle test it. Has anyone here ever been high or drunk before? Anyone high or drunk right now? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I could count on you, Timmy. <laughs> okay, so who here has ever been drunk or high before and you weren't within yourself and you did something that you didn't regret at the time, but as soon as you sobered up, you were like, ooh, fuck. Can't believe I did that. Probably shouldn't have done it. Hands up, honestly. By the way, this is like, you know, this is full, this is full responsibility. This is, I haven't quite owned it yet. Okay? This, this is, I chewed my arm off to get away. <laughs> Everyone take a drink. Fucking better be. Oh, we're getting a refund. Now, let's battle test it. Who here has ever been really angry before? done or said something when you're angry in the, in the heat of the moment where you're like, fuck you and you feel fucking you, yeah, fucking should have said that, I'm justified. But then you calm down and you're like, fuck, I way overreacted on that one. That was way, way, way. Now, flip side, has anyone ever been angry, or sad or depressed? Okay, and you said something to someone else and in the moment you felt justified. You felt it was truth. But then you calm down, sobered up and you're like, in fact, that was probably a little bit of an overreaction response. Has anyone ever here ever been so excited before? They're like, yeah, and you made a decision that when you calmed down or sobered up, you actually regretted. You see my point, right? Emotions are what drive about 98% of the dysfunction on this planet. Now, I'm not saying emotions are useless, but what I am saying, the unconscious use of alcohol and drugs causes problems. The unconscious use of emotion causes problems. When the stock market plummets, what do you think is driving it? It's not fucking rational. It's not logic. In most cases, it's unjustified, irrational emotions that people tap into. And then the big players use the irrational emotions that are unconscious of the market and they go, fuck, I know how the market works. Okay, the market works based on dysfunction, chaos, and emotion. Okay, the cool trader just sits there fucking neutral as a cucumber. Okay, all the other fucking mums and dads are like, ah! <laughs> sell, 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 sell! <laughs> and the fucking trader's going, short, 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 short. Yeah, baby, yeah. Ching, 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 ching. And the mums and dads are going, oh my God, I've got to sell my house. I've got to sell my cow. I'm going to send my kids to a fucking uh, school in fucking Papua Guinea Guinea. Whatever, right? <laughs> I don't know where that came from. I would just send your kids to Papua New Guinea to go to school, right? But my point being is, if you look at your own life, I can guarantee you, wherever the chaos or dis dysfunction is, there will be a source of motion at the root that caused a perspective that wasn't true that you go to every time you think about it because it triggers you. But if you looked at it from a conscious and neutral perspective, you would see that that event had both positive aspects to it and both negative aspects to it and here's the rub nothing in life is one-sided events all every single event in your life is hundred percent neutral until you allocate a meaning and that is your psychology okay driven by how aware you are and when we allocate a meaning we either allocate it as what it's either what there's only two meanings right it's either good or bad can't be both can it or well, maybe it can be, because after all, isn't the universe constantly seeking balance? You can't have a positive event without there being a negative consequence. You can't have a negative event without there being a positive consequence. Science tells us this, but our psychology hasn't caught on for the most part, but it has now, okay? Because what we often require 
in order to balance our perspective for most people is we refer to it as hind sight. Because sometimes something bad will happen to us and it's all motherfucking bad, right? But then six months later, we're then in a situation where we look back and go, hang on a second, that bad thing that happened put me here. I really like here. Shit, that actually wasn't a bad thing after all. That was actually really positive and good. Who's ever experienced that before? That's called hindsight. And our hack is, you don't have to wait six months to bring in hindsight. You can do it within 10 seconds. The question is, is how conscious of you of your psychology and emotions. Your psychology interprets meaning, okay? Your consciousness determines what that meaning is and where your emotions are. So our goal is, how do we amplify consciousness in either overwhelmingly exciting or underwhelmingly depressing and sad situations in order, in order not to be jaded or biased so that we can see the bigger picture. Some of the sales guys, okay, I've already been listening yesterday, okay, you get a little bit of a nibble, you go fucking straight into excitement mode. You don't stay neutral. How do you get the most out of someone in a sales environment? You stay neutral and you don't fucking jump in when you get excited. You stay calm. This is where money lives. Money is entrusted to the people who stay calm. Not to the people who get really excited, not to the people who you know, sound really sad or depressed, but to the people who can balance both emotions. Now, is, this, is, is what I'm saying to be interpreted as emotions are bad? Some of you are like, I don't fucking know. <laughs> are they? Is alcohol bad? Alcohol's not bad if you don't abuse it. Okay, alcohol, well actually, <laughs> we used to think that there were certain therapeutic uh, applications to things like red wine. We now have discovered that there is no level or quantity of alcohol that is good for the body. No, science now tells us that. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> but hang on, didn't you just say? <laughs> Look, I'm sure there are some things that it is good for. Uh, frankly, it does pretty well for a beer buzz. Some people find it a good way to relax. But my point being is, there's nothing wrong with you going out on a Friday night and having two or three beers. If that's what you want to do, as long as you don't harm anyone in the process of ingesting your beers or harm yourself psychologically, physically or otherwise, go, for gold. go and have three beers, go and have four beers, go and have five beers. But if you can't leave the pub until you are absolutely obliterated after drinking 15 beers, okay, we've got a problem okay, that we perhaps need to talk about. It's not funny. But do you guys take my point? Emotions are what give a level of richness to life. They are the things that often provide us, you know, solitude from the, in some cases, you know, the, the monotony of, you know, what could be considered certain aspects of life. Why do you think drugs and alcohol are so popular? Because they're a shortcut to an emotional state. It's like pressing a button to feel a particular emotion. Okay, and that's what people are looking for. They're looking for a shortcut. But what I'm suggesting to you is you have all the buttons. And if you have the level of consciousness and the right psychology, you can choose to press them when you want to. And as a salesperson, you know, we've got what's called, this is the pendulum, but we've got pendulum 2.0. And pendulum 2.0, okay, isn't just to be used in sales, it's also to be applied in the market from a marketing perspective. It's also to be applied in the coaching environment. And pendulum 2.0 is when you consciously choose which emotions you're going to use in order to amplify the context of the situation. You're not going to be driving unconscious and blind at the wheel. You're choosing to use a level of excitement in your voice to bring someone with you. Okay? Or you're choosing to lower your octave okay, and create a little bit of scarcity or even a little bit of fear around existing issues and pains that they've got. Okay? This is what drives the whole advertising industry. The whole advertising industry is driven by the drugs of emotion. How do we make people feel things? How do we make them afraid? so that they look at our solution as the way to cure that fear? How do we get them excited and give them our product as the pathway to excitement? That's what advertising and marketing is all about. But how do you do it morally and ethically? You do it morally and ethically when you apply this to situations and circumstances where what you offer them actually can fucking help them. And how do you find out if you can actually fucking help them? You fucking listen. You ask questions, lots of questions. And you don't even talk about a solution until you've got an entire business case that enables you to deliver on what it is you can promise. 
whether that be in a marketing context, which may take time with multiple videos, or in a sales context, when you're sitting down and talking to someone and you hear, oh yeah, well, we've got a problem with marketing, and versus jumping straight in, you calm the fuck down and you take your time. Right, what other issues do you have? This context is not just helpful in your job, it's also gonna be very helpful in your relationships. It's gonna be very helpful. Anyone here play a competitive sport? Okay, it's gonna be, this is the stuff that I use with professional sports people as well, okay? Because how do players play at the highest level? They see, they see moves three steps ahead that other players can't. They're playing a different game. You're playing, you know, everyone else is playing checkers while you're playing chess. How do you play chess? I got that right, didn't I? Yeah, yeah. yeah right. Checkers is the basic game, right? <laughs> is by becoming more conscious. But what do you think sits in the middle that drives all of our ability to understand our emotions and all of our abilities to support, you know, whatever level of consciousness? Have we got a response from them yet? Yeah, the whole team's standing outside, so... Okay, fantastic. Just, the fastest way to solve this is send an email to our event contact and say yeah, we, we require a refund. Okay. Psychology. See, that was the application of Pendulum 2.0. Want to instill a little bit of fear in these motherfuckers? Okay. Psychology is what drives the bus. And a psychology is made up of multiple components. The first and most compo important component in a psychology, what do you think it is? It's your story. Okay, also referred to as the code. How do you think um, lessons, excuse me, information, knowledge, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, has been passed down through the ages? Story. Story through stories, through storytellers. Uh, once upon a time, it was around a campfire, okay? Then it evolved into a cave, okay? Then it moved into a small village, Okay, then it moved to a fucking radio, and then it moved to a TV, and now Netflix and the internet. But the way that information is passed down from generation to generation, the way lessons are passed down from generation to generation is through the telling of stories. And what we've got to fundamentally understand is your brain is a bioorganic computer that is like a sponge just searching for commands. And whatever commands that you're given at a very early age are typically implanted, and then they're put on a loop and you become unconscious and you just run them. Because that's how I was brought up. That's how, my mama, that's how my mama taught me. That's how my daddy taught me. What is one of the stories that we teach kids in order to keep them safe? Don't talk to, Don't talk to strangers. And so as a result, what do you think a lot of people really suffer with when it comes to socialization? When they're older, <laughs> talking to strangers. Because they're told when they're young, not to. So they fucking hate networking. <laughs> you see my point? I don't know why, I just fucking hate networking. Did your mum tell you not to talk to strangers? Yeah, she did actually. Ha ha. <laughs> it's fucking true. But because we're not conscious of it, we don't see the connection. Your stories are the code. Now, the goal is if you want to perform at the highest level is how do we shine the consciousness lens on the stories, not just every now and then, but all the fucking time. Well, that sounds hard. It might, might be a little bit at first, but how do you become conscious for five minutes every day? What do you do to become more conscious of your stories every single day? You practice. You practice becoming more conscious. What are certain practices that you can engage in to help you become more conscious? Meditation. Meditation. Beautiful way to become more conscious. Because all of a sudden, you start becoming, sit and meditate. Because most people think meditation is sitting there and thinking about fucking bad thoughts or just sitting there and fucking thinking about all the things they're, that they're stressed about, because that's what a lot of people do. But what a lot of people don't realize is, if you keep practicing that over and over, sooner or later you run out of things to think about. And you start to see other things, which is nothing. You start to see the nothingness that exists in your brain, and you start to see the beauty in that. And that's where real potential lives. Real potential lives in the silence in your mind, not in the noise. But we've got to become conscious. So how do we do that? We practice becoming conscious for five minutes every day. And once we've mastered becoming conscious for five minutes every day, what do we do then? Ten. Let's try ten minutes every day. Let's practice being conscious ten minutes every day. But if this becomes a discipline, a conscious discipline and a practice, eventually what happens? It becomes a habit.
See, the reason that most people aren't conscious is because they haven't, on a regular basis, is because they haven't developed the habit. And things that aren't habits are hard. Why? Because it requires thought and effort. But if you apply thought and effort continuously over a period of 64 days, 65, 66 days, guess what happens? It becomes autonomous. Now it just happens naturally. You don't even have to fucking try. It's effortless. But it's how do we apply it consistently for extended periods of time to reach that point? It's through practice. You know, when Federer gets fucking... Okay, he's not the best example. He just lost. But um, I love him anyway. Still love him even though he lost. He's, the be he's one of the best examples. Like, this is Federer hitting a bad shot. This is Federer hitting a winning shot. 90% of the time, there is no fucking change in his face. He is a master because he has continually practiced the basics over and over and over again. So when someone hits him a shot, he doesn't even have to fucking think. He can hit it from between his legs. How the fuck do you, you literally have, as a tennis player at, at, at that elite level, less than a fraction of a fraction of a second to determine what shot you're going to do use in order to return that ball? How does he choose? He doesn't. He doesn't choose consciously. He doesn't sit there and go, okay, ball's coming at 180 fucking miles an hour. It's coming down here. I'm going to literally just hit that just on a 45 degree angle. I'm going to place it just at... His body, his brain, his form has been so conditioned through the repetition of practice over and over and over. He doesn't think he's going to go, boom. Yeah, fuck, that's a shot I wanted. No expression change. Why? Because he's not emotionally engaged in the pursuit. But at the end of the tournament, when he wins, what does he do? All the emotion that was bubbling at the surface that he was regulating to keep down, regulating to keep down, he gets to the end, what does he do? That's what I love about Federer. He's one of the most authentic men in sport because he will sit there and fucking cry and cry and cry in front of billions of people and he's okay with it. He shows his emotions because he's not afraid, which in itself is another lesson. But it's the stories. How do we make the stories autonomous? We become selective. We start choosing, okay, fuck, what are the behaviors that I want? Okay, okay, I want to wake up at 4.30 every fucking morning. Right, so what's the story I've got to use on a regular basis? I've got to say to myself every day, 34 times a day, I will wake up at 4.30 a.m. You will wake up <laughs> at 4.30 a.m. And as a result, because anyone here, let's, t let's battle test this. Who here has ever had this situation before? You're like, okay, I've got to wake up at 5.30 tomorrow morning. Got to wake up at 5.30 tomorrow morning. I'll set my alarm for 5.30 tomorrow morning. And all of a sudden, you wake up and you look at your watch and it's 5.28. Yeah. Who's ever had that before? That is nothing more than an example of your potential. How did you do that? Oh, it was a fucking serendipitous coincidence. No, you fucking suggested it to yourself repetitiously for an extended period of time. And as a result, your brain responded accordingly. How does your brain know what the fucking time is? It does. Okay, it's got a universal clock that it's, fucking, it's connected to. It's called the divine. Our goal is to become more conscious of the stories that we're running. If you look at any behavior you've got in your life right now, and you're sitting there going, why the fuck do I do that? It's because you haven't switched the light on to the story that you're running that's producing that behavior. It's running, it's there. The question is, can you hear it? Who's got a little voice in their head? Okay, the people who don't have a little voice in their head are going, I don't have a voice in my head. <laughs> Everyone's got a motherfucking voice in the head. The question is, is do you listen to it? Or have you heard it for so long saying the same thing over and over <clears throat> that you've just convinced yourself that it's just you? It ain't you. Let me make this clear. The story, the voice in your head, it ain't you. It's the ego. Now, I'm not trying to put you at war with your ego because that's probably one of the most destructive and dangerous things you can do. But what I am suggesting is there's an opportunity to tame it. But most importantly, you can program your ego. What do you think your ego is, is literally, ultimately, what is the end goal of the ego? Satisfaction. Satisfaction. It wants to protect you. It wants to keep you safe. Why? Because the ego doesn't want to die. The ego doesn't want to die. What do you think spiritual liberation is all about? Ego death. Spiritual liberation is about ego death. The death of the ego. And when people's ego, when people have the death of the ego, guess what they embrace? Death, because they no longer become fearful of it. There's a, there's a great book called um, The Tibetan Book of the Dead. Has anyone heard of The Tibetan Book of the Dead? It's basically a book that the monks wrote about death and the other side and the, and the 49 days 
seven by seven days that it takes in order for you to reincarnate. And what they do, what monks do, is they sit down with people who are on their deathbed and they teach them the Book of the Dead. And what that teaching does is it helps them allow their ego to die before they do. Because when their ego dies before they do, guess what happens? They're no longer afraid because they realize what they came from, they're going to. And it's all one, right? And I don't want to get all fucking woozy woozy on you, right? But my point being is, you're not, your soul is not afraid of death because your soul knows it's just a transitional period, okay? Your ego is afraid because your ego is attached to, but I'm a fucking, I'm a, I'm a brother, I'm a son, I'm a father, I'm a mother, I'm a whatever, social media fucking expert, I'm a filmmaker. Your ego is attached to all these roles and it doesn't want to relinquish that because if it relinquishes that, what does the ego become? Nothing. And if the ego is nothing, life is meaningless. So your life derives ego through your identity. Your ego derives life through your identity. Okay? And a lot of your ego has been programmed, okay, unconsciously through your environment to run stories to protect you from the things that you think you should be afraid of. Don't talk to strangers. Now, touch wood, this never fucking comes back to haunt me. But I've, I've gone through stranger danger with my son, but I, just, I don't tell him not to talk to strangers. I tell him not to go away from strangers. And if someone tries to take him or touch him or anything else, then you know, scream, yell, and everything else. But as a result, my kid, Noah, freaks people out on a daily basis because we'll be walking down the road and he'll be like, hi. And if people look at him and they don't say anything, he'll go, hi, hi, hello. And say, so, oh, hi. He's going, and they'll keep walking. Hi, hi. And he says fucking hi to everyone. And I sit there, it's fucking honestly, it's, it's amazing to watch because he has no fear. Why? Because I haven't taught him to be afraid of people. Okay? And as a result, he can stand on, he's been standing on stage since the age of two. Okay? And now he can stand on stage at the age of four and five. And he can talk in front of 400, 500 people. And he can do things that most adults can't. Why? Because I haven't taught him how to be afraid. I taught him how to. Not, I, didn't, I didn't have to teach him not to be afraid. I just taught him how to be a natural human being, which is what? A social animal. We're all social animals. So when we start becoming conscious of the ego's stories, we can start to train the ego. That's actually not what we should be afraid of. That's actually something we need to be moving towards. Oftentimes the ego is afraid of what? Money. Why? Because people with money are often criticized, condemned, framed as being bad motherfuckers. Okay, I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with people, this is going back when Kerry Pack was alive, because I really admired what Kerry done, did. I know, you know he had certain aspects of his personality that were a little bit you know, interesting, but I really admired what he did. And I, I can't tell you how many times people would sit down and I'd have conversations and go, oh, fucking Kerry Packer, he's such a C-U-N-T. And I'd be like, whoa, so you know Kerry? Nope. You know someone who knows Kerry? Nope. You've done business with someone? Who, nope. So why is this account? Oh, it's, you know, I've seen all the media reports. Wow. And when you, con when you consider, when you look at success, and I'm not even talking about money here, but when you look at success, was success revered? Who watched cartoons when they were kids? Who watched a lot of fucking cartoons when they were kids? Who was the successful person? Who was the person? The people, success, well, first of all, Successful people in cartoons almost didn't exist. Who, who, who were the people that were successful in cartoons that were positioned as successful? Scrooge. Okay? Or Mr. Burns. And so is it any wonder why we develop this fear of success? People go, I'm a fear of success. No, you watch too many fucking cartoons, motherfucker. You're not afraid of success. That, that's irrational. That is an irrational fear. I, have, I know with very good certainty that if you become successful, you don't die. Okay? No one hurts you. People might say bad things about you who don't know you, but what is that? Don't they do that anyway? Yeah, point in case, case in point. If we truly want to master the game of life, because you know, people often say, uh, no, not people, um, Buddha was the one who quoted this. He said, uh, life is pain. Suffering is optional. 
You can't escape pain in your life. You are going to have pain. You're going to have things that don't go your way. You're going to have emotions that come out that aren't going to be supportive. But the suffering part, that's going to be determined by what that pain means. You know, so as human beings, in order to be fulfilled, what do we need? What do we need? What is the, if not the most important, if not the number one requirement to live a fulfilled life? You need to master the ability to create meaning. Because that's what we're here for. We're here, to, we're here in search for meaning. Why are we here? What does it mean? How do we find out what thing? You don't find out. Here's the thing. This is what I've learned. You don't find out. You're not here to search to find out what things mean. You're here to define them. You are not here to seek out, to discover what things mean. You're here to define it. You know, God created you in his image. You are God. We are all fragments of. And by God, I'm not referring to a God that sits up there judgmentally ticking off. Oh, yep, good boy, bad boy, good boy, bad boy. I'm talking about a divine higher energy, a divine higher source that is driving all creation, expansion. That is the universe. That is completely unconditional that has no emotional context, that is just a pure energy that is driving through us to create. The question is, is how connected are you to it? Because the more conscious you are of the energy that is around you, the more able you are to channel it through you in order to create the things that you want. You can have anything that you want in this world. The question is, is do you know how to manage the meanings of the things that happen before you get there? Do you know how to manage the meanings of the things that happen before you get there so that you realize everything that happens before you get there is by virtue there to support you getting there? I still remember uh, it, was in, it was in September 2004. Um, now, judge me if you want. I'm just going to share a story. September 2004, I just had, uh, it was my second, third, fourth business. I had a really successful run. I'd made um, $6.9 million in a business in about a nine-month period. Uh, life was going really well. Things were great. And I remember thinking to myself, fuck, if I can do this in nine months by myself with one PA, okay, imagine what I can do in the next, because at that I was like, what was I, 30? I said, what can I do in the next 60 years? I was like, you know what? I'm going to set the intention to become a billionaire by the age of 60, 65. And please understand, the intention wasn't, oh, -ha -ha -ha, I want to be a billionaire. <laughs> The intention was, imagine how much change I could affect if I had a billion dollars in assets behind me. Imagine how many lives I could impact and affect, because what I learned at a very early age is you don't affect the world. There's no amount of poverty that you can acquire that will help you change the world. Okay? What changes the world is capital. And people who have it are the ones that determine how this world goes. And the ones that are greedy okay, are going to lead to the world's destructions, and the ones that are in, have a heightened level of consciousness will lead to its salvation. And so for me, I remember going, you know what? Fuck it, I'm going to go for it. Because I remember thinking at the time, even if I only make it halfway, it's not going to be the worst fucking failure in the world, is it? But then I thought, even if I only make it 10% of the way, fuck, I'm winning. I was like, fuck it, yeah, I want to be a billionaire. Why not? It'll be fun. I can do a lot. Like literally, that was the conversation. Two weeks later, the business partnership that I'd just gone into, like three months previously, we went into a partnership. And it was the worst decision of my life because when you're in a partnership structure, any personal liabilities that your partner acquires become your personal liabilities. He did something a little bit fucking sketchy, and as a result, he brought against himself the class action. But the only reason the class action came against him is because people, uh, their lawyers did a search and found out that I was connected to him, and they knew exactly what I was doing and the, and the, and the worth that I had, and they went, fuck it, we'll just sue him because we're not going to be able to get anything out of him, but we can get fucking millions out of Kerwin. And so as a result, I get pulled into this class action that had, get this, Nothing to do with me. Nothing. Not a fucking... Nothing. Imagine that. Imagine the emotion that you're wanting to indulge in. Oh, why me? I'm a good man. I do good things. Imagine the stories are going in my head, right? Consciousness, fuck, it had left the building. <laughs> I was fucking angry. Sad. Distraught. You know... Mix of emotions, and none of them were positive. And so over the next three months, I proceeded to spend a million dollars on legals after tax. So just to give you context, uh, how much money do you have to make in order to have a million dollars after tax? Somewhere between 2 and 2.6, right? So I didn't spend a million bucks. 
I spent you know, 2, 2 to $2.6 million worth of my own productivity I had to spend on legal bills for a situation that had nothing to fucking do with me. And the whole way through it, fuck, my emotions were running rife. My anxiety, Jesus Christ. Panic attacks, anxiety. I, didn't, I, don't, I don't know if I classify as depression, but I was just not a happy guy. Stories were running my head. Again, consciousness left the building. And it was about the four-month mark. Consciousness started to creep back in. And so I went, okay, Kerwin, this is becoming a destructive force in your life. It was affecting my health. It was affecting mental health. It was affecting my physical health. It was affecting relationships with friends. Okay, it was affecting relationships with clients. The relationship with my business partner was sh completely blown up. But we're in a partnership, so I can't get the fuck out of it. And I started to go, okay, Kerwin, we need to find a new meaning because the meaning we have right now, it's not helping. And I was like, okay, let's search for meaning. No, let's define it. Let's look at, this, let's look at the series of events that led to this. And I was like, I don't know what led to this. And then all of a sudden I remember going, do you remember you set the intention to become a billionaire? And I was like, fuck yeah, I remember that intention. What are some of the skills that you need in order to build a billion dollars? What are some of the experience? What are some of the knowledge? What are some of the skills that are required in order to amass over a 60 year period, a billion dollars in wealth? And I was like, fucking a lot of legal knowledge? And I was like, yes. And I remember going, oh my God, I created this. Holy shit, this isn't him, this is me. Oh my God. Whew. Bing, defined. I created this. It wasn't him, it was me. I chose this. I just couldn't see it at the time. My higher self was playing a 60 year game. I was stuck in a fucking day to day game. I couldn't see the higher self going, right, in order for Kerwin to get here, this is some of the skills, knowledge, and experience he needs. He's probably not going to see it for a couple of months, but it'll be fucking fun to watch. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the fucking kooky part. <laughs> Two weeks later, lawsuit dropped. No mention of why. No contact from the other side. Dropped. Just <laughs> vaporized. I was like, huh. Fuck, I wish I'd worked this out three months ago. <laughs> <laughs> but I, felt, I went to myself. I was like, like I'm, not, I'm talking deep, 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 deep levels. Deep, deep, deep levels. Deep, deep, deep levels of awe and wonder in how this universe plays out. We can't always see what's going to happen in the long game, but what we requ what's required in the short game is a level of consciousness <coughs> and an ability to manage our own psycho psychology to determine how we deal with these moments before we get there. But what we need is we need to have faith. We need to have trust that whatever is coming up for us is exactly what we need. You know, Eckhart Tolle said it best. Fuck, what was it? <laughs> um, whatever, whatever life is thrown, you, fuck, can you Google it really quickly? Eckhart Tolle, um, meaning of, uh, famous quote. Um, whatever life, just go whatever life. Any of those ones? Nope. Just go, whatever life, whatever, nope, whatever life gives you. No, that's not it. I, I posted it on my Facebook page the other day. Can you find it out? Anyway, I'll give it to you. Cause nope. Whatever life experience is giving to you right now is the experience, whatever life is... Okay, here we go. Life will give you whatever experience is most helpful for the evolution of your consciousness. How do you know this experience is the one that you need? Because this is the experience you're having at the moment. That's a big pill. Oftentimes bigger than most people's ability to swallow. But if we can chip away at it on a daily basis, we can break that pill down into fragments and it's a lot easier to swallow. But what's required is a level of faith. Okay. I can tell you right now, I didn't get here because I knew I was going to get here. I got here because there was a skerrick of hope. There was a skerrick of faith that over time turned in from a grain of sand to a small pebble, from a pebble to a rock, to a rock to a boulder. And you know, it's now sitting in a castle of faith, 
that is you know, surrounded by an incredible group of individuals that every day come in and lay a stone. Every day come in and lay a stone. And the castle just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But the beautiful thing is, is every single one of you are part of that creation. All of you are part, you're here for a reason. And some of you, to finish off, may not even know what that reason is right now. And that's totally okay. But you need to have faith. But whatever's being thrown at you is exactly what you need. But the model I've given you here right here, I haven't even given you the, the rest of what's in your psychology. I'll give you, you guys want a little bit more? Yes. We've got time? We've got two minutes. Two minutes, right. <laughs> the second aspect of your psychology is your belief system. And your belief system is nothing more than a filtration system. Because your brain is a cognitive miser. It hates using energy. It hates processing and burning energy. So what will it do? It will constantly look for ways okay, to use a default mode network in order to view the world and make decisions so it doesn't have to think. So you say to yourself, the salt isn't there. Salt isn't there. Pfft, salt gone. Don't worry about looking for it. It's not there. It's gone. Have a little look. Oop, see, told you. It makes your life easy for you. you know, what you say to yourself on a regular basis will determine what you believe. And what you believe will determine everything you see. If you believe there's no opportunity for you in this organisation, that's exactly what you'll see. You'll see no opportunity for you here whatsoever. If you see an organisation full of potential, full of growth, full of you know, opportunity at a global level, then that's exactly what you see. Okay, if you see in your role that there are certain things that are impossible to do, then you'll be shown nothing but roadblocks. If you can see that there's nothing more than a solution waiting to be found, then you'll be presented with lots of them. The question is, is how conscious are you of the story that you're running and the limiting belief system that you're engaged in in that moment? And lastly, I'll give you this, the last two really quickly, and we'll spend more time on them later. You've got your values which for us is all about a value system is nothing more than a motive, a reason to do. The stories you tell yourself will determine what you believe. What you believe will determine what you see. What you believe and what you see will determine the things that are important to you. What you believe will determine what's important to you. And what's important to you will become the reasons why you do the things that you do. And if there are certain things that you're not doing that you know you need to do, the only thing is, the reason is that you're not pursuing them is because there's no motive. Okay? When people commit a crime, the first thing the police officers generally do is they look for what? <coughs> motive. What was the motive? They look for someone who's got the biggest motive. Who's got the biggest reason to cause this criminal act or engage in this criminal act? If you want to be the very best at what you do, but you're not pursuing the things that will make you the best at what you do, you clearly have no motive. There's no reason why. And you've either got to consciously seek search and find or define the meaning or you program yourself to make it important. You can literally do that if you choose to. Okay? Making, you know, doing what I do, making money, this stuff never came easy to me. I was not just gifted with something, oh, you're going to be able to do this and help people and do that. No. In 2001, 2000, 2001, I came up with what I called the list of the, it started off as the Ten Commandments and ended up being this big long sheet. And I literally sat down one day and I was like, okay, what are all the things that I need in order to be and feel successful? I was like, well, you need to be a master of persuasion and influence. Okay, you need to be a master of relationships and delivering value. You need a photographic memory and everything you see, hear, feel, taste, touch and smell. You need to be able to recall it with crystal clear accuracy. And I came up with an entire list and a couple of pages of suggestions. And guess what I did every day? I just recited them every day, every day, every day, every day, every day, every day. And over the years, that list has grown and it's, and it's, and it's shrunk. But I can tell you, without, without, any, without nothing more than the utmost authenticity and transparency and truth, every single one of those things on that list, except for one, has come to fruition. And not because I had the academic skills or the qualifications. If anything, I was behind the eight ball. I literally program myself to do what I'm doing today. And not in a illegitimate or ill-meaning way because I just knew this is where I was going in my life, but I just didn't have the skills to get there. So how did I get the skills? I programmed myself. But the key is I did it consciously. I didn't allow my environment to do it for me. I chose it consciously. 
you know, and in your pursuit, you know, whether it be in the next few days, next few months, next few years of us, whatever that looks like, I'm going to ask you to be consciously practicing consciousness and allow whatever happens to you for you to define the meaning in a neutral way where you can see both sides of the equation. Things aren't just bad, okay, but they're not just good. They're not just good, they're not just bad. They're both. And you can choose what they mean, but there's never, there is never bad in isolation and there's never good in isolation. And the person who sees the most information is going to be the one that has the most options, the one that has the most choices, and the one that's going to have the most potential. Potential comes down to options. You know, the particle with the most potential is the one that has the most trajectories, trajectories, the one that can go in the most directions, multi-ordinate directions. You're just like this little particle full of potential just waiting to be expressed. And the only thing that's preventing you is you consciously defining how that potential wants to be expressed. And some people go through life and they create a very successful life and they do all of this stuff totally unconsciously. I've actually sat down with billionaires who have done all of this stuff totally unconsciously and they had no idea that they did it, but they fucking did it. My pursuit was, how do I do this consciously so I can share it? How can you do this consciously so that you can share it? How can you do this consciously so that you can make it a part of your life's work? Something to think about. You guys enjoy that? Yes! All right, thank you very much.